So I really like that reading because it helps set the scene for why we talk about Martin Luther King and why this Sunday. Uh, because there's some good questions to ask, like why MLK and not others? Well, part of it that's, it's been easy over the years to sanitize his legacy and quote him out of context. Even people who he would have vehemently disagreed with now quote him completely stripped of what he actually meant. So it can be easy to sort of box this up, and I don't want to do that, but I do want to celebrate it today and think about it. And not just in a historical sort of that happened so many years ago way, but in a where are we now and how have we moved forward that legacy? What's the status of the dream is another way to think about it. So hold that thought for a minute because I'm going to take a slight detour. Uh, earlier this week, I was watching uh, my alma mater, the University of Houston, their men's basketball team, play last week at Iowa State. Uh, they lost, which is sad for me, but it happens, of course, right? But as I was watching this, uh, streaming now, because that's how I do things, I don't even have cable, uh, that's irrelevant, but um, the thing that struck me about this, though, is that a lot of the stuff I watch doesn't have advertisements anymore, maybe you too. This, of course, did because it was actual live TV. And so I was watching this, and the ads were just incredible because, of course, they were almost entirely political ads, specifically from Republican candidates attacking other Republican candidates for various hot-button issues. I, I probably don't need to illuminate what those issues are. You can use your imagination. And over the course of, you know, the game's two hours or whatever, it slowly occurred to me, I'm watching a game that is being played in Iowa against Iowa State, and of course the caucuses are this week in Iowa. Of course that's what this is, right? Now I live in Maryland right now, and before that I was in California, I grew up in Texas, I lived in Mississippi for a while, later Massachusetts, and so I've managed to, though living in quite a few states, mostly live in states that are not hugely competitive in presidential elections, at least of the last, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 years. And indeed, most of them, the primaries aren't even that important in our system because they don't come on the first few weeks of the season, right? In other words, I don't remember seeing this many political ads that often. But Iowa, oh Iowa. The first stop of, they do caucuses, but you know, caucus and primary season. And the ads, just based on my small two hour sample this week, must be absolutely overwhelming and awful. I imagine that here, uh, if you get any Pennsylvania ads, you may have had this experience at some point in your life, like four years ago, and about to come up any time now. I say all of that because it made me think a lot about voting, right? That's what it's about. And that brings me right back to Martin Luther King, and specifically the 1965 Voting Rights Act, which absolutely revolutionized voting in this country. And of course, for the 50 years since, has been slowly dismantled to the point where a lot of it is no longer in force, especially the most important parts. So of course, that's not the only uh, voting that is, is not the only or even perhaps the most important civil rights issue of our day. But I do think it's one without which I don't know that other change can happen, at least in our country. Uh, in his own work, MLK supported voting rights as well. I'm about to quote him, so hopefully not out of context. This is very much in context. He said, and I quote, voting is the foundation stone for political action, which sums it all up right there. In some recent years, uh, his family, the family of Martin Luther King Jr., including his son Martin III, Martin III's wife Andrea, their daughter Yolanda, have called upon politicians and indeed all of us to not celebrate MLK Day unless we're going to work for racial justice now. And in an election year coming up in which voter suppression attempts are and will be rampant, I think that means talking about voting. 
So as today and tomorrow we honor MLK's legacy by doing whatever we can to ensure voting rights are real for all people. That takes many forms. I know I've talked to people in this room that have worked in the past and will work again to register voters. I think of those of us who have worked to pressure our lawmakers to pass legislation. The John Lewis Voting Rights Act is still stuck in congressional purgatory. It failed to pass in 2021 and 2022. It does not look like its prospects are great this year either, not with the election looming this fall. I know other people work with various community organizations to make change in our local communities by working together, including working with our elected officials. And nationally, Unitarian Universalists have worked on many issues, including uh, with UU The Vote, a nationwide campaign to register voters, and encourage participation, and work on specific issues of importance. UU The Vote included on-the-ground organizers in several of those aforementioned swing states as well as things like postcard writing. I think some people in here participated in postcard writing campaigns to encourage people to vote. I participated myself in previous congregations. Back to MLK, his work with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference in Selma in 1965 directly led to the passage of the Voting Rights Act later that year. Again, to quote him, he said, in Selma we see a classic pattern of disenfranchisement typical of the Southern Black Belt areas where Negroes are in the majority. That 1965 act ended poll taxes, it ended literacy tests, which had been used to prevent black people from voting, among the many other measures it implemented. But still, we see that in many parts of the South, and not just the South, but especially parts where black people and other people of color are a majority, political power is suppressed. Some of my colleagues in the South like to point out that many states down there aren't red states, but rather voter suppression states. So voting matters, and making sure that all people can vote matters. It mattered in 1965, it matters today. And I've heard, I've experienced the despair. Maybe you have too. When I vote, it doesn't seem to make any difference. Even the better choice is still between two pretty bad choices, you might think. None of our elected leaders can get anything done anyway. And there are some jarring facts. Despite all of these efforts and with record turnout, about one third of eligible voters did not bother to vote in the 2020 presidential election, which I would characterize as the most important election of my lifetime. And I sympathize a little bit with this line of thinking. It can be incredibly frustrating to vote and think your vote doesn't matter. I already mentioned, I'm, I'm from Texas. I, I've been a voter in many elections where my vote did not seem to make any difference in the outcome. And I'm frustrated with our current national administration, with Congress, with the federal government, its inability or unwillingness to lead and make positive change for us. And yet, despite all of that, over and over again, the truth is that voting does matter. It sometimes does result in positive change. Anyone who has had their preferred candidate elected know that's true. Even if you've merely prevented something awful from happening, you've done something important. If you voted on a local school bonds issue and seen the improved facilities that follow, you know that's true. Electing good leaders matters. It's how so much of our national government is run by the people we elect to Congress, to the White House. I know I'm speaking, saying this again, but those of you who live in Pennsylvania are keenly aware of how much voting matters in our national elections. In fact, I often question people who are constantly saying that voting doesn't matter. We've seen that many of them are attempting all too successfully to undermine confidence in the voting system. The people who are trying to suppress votes clearly think that voting matters. We've seen systematic attempts to call into question all of our voting, all of our democratic apparatus, not just these last few years, though it's certainly ramped up, but for many years now. As I just said, if voting didn't matter, they wouldn't be trying so hard to stop people from voting. 
I spoke about the record turnout, uh, voter turnout of 2020 a few, few months ago, and that was despite a, a pandemic. That record happened in large part because of the work of jurisdictions to improve methods of voting, of voting to make them accessible. More voting by mail, more early voting, more drop-off points for early ballots. In Houston, where I lived for a number of years, they set up 24-hour drive-through voting. There were, of course, subsequent lawsuits trying to say that that was illegal. But 24-hour voting makes it possible for shift workers to vote for people who have more mobility issues to vote from the seat of their vehicle. And it won't be news to many of you, but there's a coordinated effort to stop or reduce many of these practices. I haven't even gone into voter ID laws, which serve absolutely no purpose. Voter fraud of the kind that they're designed to prevent is so rare as to be insignificant. It almost doesn't exist. What voter ID laws do, of course, is make it harder for some people to vote. Voting is a constitutionally protected right. We should have the absolute highest bars for anything that could make voting harder, but that's the opposite of what's happening across our country. So I say this once again, are there good reasons to object to voting? Maybe. For instance, there's the argument that participating in a system that is so flawed and damaging makes you complicit in the system. But I don't think opting out solves that problem. And for me, on this Sunday, but on every day, as a white man in America, I think it's deeply problematic to think that I could hold voting so lightly. Our nation's history is one of excluding most people, women, people of color, native peoples, from voting. Even today, it's rightly pointed out in many states, those who have been convicted of felonies cannot vote even after they're released from prison. That's problematic for many reasons, but uh, the one I'll lift up is the disparate way that people of color are treated by our justice system. They are far more likely to have felony convictions. So vote, because voting matters. But voting, of course, is not the only thing that matters. Some of the critics are right that people show up to vote and expect that to fix everything. I'll go back to MLK's quote. He didn't say voting fixes everything but rather voting is the foundation stone for political action. We have to build upon it. I've experienced this even in congregations, you might be shocked to know. If something is really important to you here, you have to be involved. You have to follow up. Because our staff and lay leaders are good people with good intentions, but we screw up sometimes, or we run out of time, or we simply forget something. And we appreciate those who follow up and want to make sure that all of us are doing the best we can for all of us. As I said earlier, I don't have great hope for the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, at least in the short term, but I have spoken to my representative in Congress about it. I hope you will too. I hope that each of us will do what we can to support and protect voting rights for all people and that this year, in an election year, we will vote. It's the right thing to do, what our conscience calls us to do, what living MLK's legacy today means. So all of us must do what we can, what we must. May it be so.